this week on Break Free Millions with Ifat Khan, meet Lou Adler. Lou Adler is the CEO of and founder of the Adler Group, a consulting and training firm helping companies implement the win-win hiring programs using his performance-based hiring system. With over 150,000 people following and learning from him over the past 40 years, Lou is an author of Amazon's top 10 bestsellers, Hire With Your Head, Power Hiring, Essential Guide for Hiring and Getting Hired, Talent Rules and many more. Lou is based out of United States, California. He's been featured on Fox News, INC Magazine, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, Business Insider. So let's meet Lou Adler. How are you? I'm doing very well. And how are you doing? Doing well, Lou. It's about 2.45 a.m. here. <laughs> I know. I knew it was real early in the morning. I was surprised yes. you were there. Yes, I mean, I love this. I've been working for, for U.S. I've worked for U.S., so I, I'm kind of used to this shift. No, oh, it sounds miserable to me. <laughs> so how have you been? Like, how has this entire pandemic kind of been for you? Well, we're handling it. I live in a <laughs> beach community in Southern California, so we're okay. okay. And got plenty of food, so. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Plenty That's of toilet paper. Just got a whole case of toilet paper to arrive today, so we're in good shape for another month or two. So that's good. That's good. So how are you, how are you doing? India is a little bit more challenging, isn't it? It is. It is challenging, but we are we are kind of keeping it up well here. It's it's good here uh, because the situation isn't that bad. It's good. The, okay. the number of uh, cases aren't in like it's not drastically increasing, but it's it's just a couple of thousands. So we are okay. under a lockdown, like about. We were under a lockdown of 21 days. Uh, to oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to put this up uh, and reach to as many people as we can because uh, this, this subject about hiring, I, I definitely want to talk to you about that. So your book, which is uh, Hire with, with Head, right? With your head. Well, I have a couple of <laughs> books. That's an old book. That book's over, that's almost 15 years old. Oh. Um, hold on one second. I'm just going to, this is, this yeah. is the book. Yeah, That's 15, that book is 15 years old, though. So it looks uh, new. It one, looks like brand new. I this think this one's so. a little bit newer. This one's a little okay. bit newer. Uh, okay. But nonetheless, they're both uh, reasonably good books. And you, you've got one more, right? Power, higher power, power of hiring. I think so. That's well, that one was more. the yeah. that was a that was an online audio program. Oh. So I don't. That was 20 years ago. We got a lot of things around there. So. That's amazing. That's so, so you've been into this, like uh, talking about the subject, teaching the subject about how you can hire the best people for, for the past 20 years. No, for the past 40 years. Ah, that's amazing. <laughs> that's I've even been better. For a long, time. long time. Okay. Okay. Great. So I, I've got a couple of questions to ask you because this, I, I keep getting questions on what are the kind of people that we should hire? So I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. I coach a lot of entrepreneurs. I've, I'm actually into the business field. Uh, I've, been, I've worked in corporate and then I moved, I made a transition. I started my company. And then after which I, I helped, uh, I did a lot of startup consulting and then I worked with a lot of other businesses. So what I figured out is that there's uh, the kind of people that we recruit it's just on a random basis. Like, I still don't understand. I have been a part of the, the recruitment. I've been part of the hiring uh, team, but uh, I see there's a lot of pressure on the management. And I see that they just, just to fill up the job, like the vacancy that they have, just to fill that up, uh, they kind of hire anyone, <laughs> whoever is available and ready to, to take the pay that they're offering. Uh, and they just hire them and in, in a year or so, they don't even last for a year. So why is that so Lou? What, I mean, how can we, uh, you know, manage that something like that? Okay. So I make a contention that most people do hire for the start date mm -hmm. as opposed to for the a year anniversary date one year later. Mm -hmm. In my mind, the fundamental criteria to hire for the start date is what you just said. Okay. Take the pay, have these skills, and we'll hire that person. Mm -hmm. There's no 
understanding on the hiring manager's part or the candidate's part of the work they're going to do. Right. When you change the focus to hire for the anniversary date, which means the candidate says, I'm glad I took this job. I'm happy it. I like this job. Okay. And the hiring manager says, I like that person. Okay. That is a totally different decision-making process at every step of the way from how you define the job, how uh -huh. you find candidates, how you interview candidates, and how you uh, negotiate an offer. Fundamentally different. One yeah. is a high-touch, slower process. The other one is a transactional process. Mm -hmm. And if you continue to use this transactional process, focusing on day one criteria, salary, title, location, compensation, mm -hmm. you're going to fail. Every It's mm -hmm. pure random luck if yeah. you'll be winning. So you got to just say, hey, I got to reboot hiring and focus on the anniversary date, yeah. not the start date. I mean, that's easier said than done, but that's the root cause of the problem. Uh, all right. So something which, which I read in your book, which was uh, about hiring not on the basis of first impression. So let's say the, the candidate walks in and uh, you know, most often we do make assumptions and we, we feel that maybe you know, this person is smart enough or this person is uh, probably you know, good for the work or maybe not good for the work, is good for the rapport that they have with the, with, the, with, the, with the candidate and they just go about hiring them. So, I mean, I, I really loved that point. Uh, why? Because I have attended a lot of interviews when I was in corporate and then when I came to a position where I started recruiting people, there was such a big conflict because the way I, I used to recruit would be based on what exactly they can do and how they can benefit my company and how they can help my company grow. Uh, and also based on the attitude, like, you know, are they actually hungry enough? Do they really want to contribute or is it just because they want to earn some money or is it just because they don't have something better to do that they want to come and join my company? So there was, this was like quite conflicting. So the ones which I have attended and I was, I was the candidate giving the interview, uh, you know, the interview, the panel, the panel that, that sat with me, uh, they, they kind of took me till the last round and then I get to know uh, that they already have somebody, uh, already, they already have somebody, you know, which they selected. So what was the point of actually doing this entire, uh, you know, just running around with doing interviews and things like that? So I, I never well, get, understood that. <laughs> well, you just, first one is first impressions. Mm -hmm. And when we like people, we ask easier questions and we don't like people, we ask hard questions. Mm -hmm. And even if we like somebody, we avoid even hearing a bad answer. We just ignore it. We don't even hear it. Uh, mm -hmm. So the idea, so that's just one thing. Yeah. Uh, now, the way around that is, is I suggest that nobody ever meets anybody in person first. Mm -hmm. They always conduct a phone screen and they just ask the candidate, hey, Elite, how do you pronounce your last name or your first name? If I. If I. Yeah. If I. Uh, <laughs> Here's one of the big accomplishments we need done. Tell me about something you've accomplished most related to that. And you spend 15 or 20 minutes seeing if the candidate's even a fit. Uh -huh. Based on that, you bring the person in. And uh -huh. then the, just because you've conducted that, the first impression bias is almost insignificant. So okay. just that alone will change it. But it also says you also will never need to bring more than three or four people in because right. most of the people won't have accomplished anything related to what you want done. So, and you've also had the candidate decides to come in and says, yeah, I want to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. So it's a great tool to minimize first impression bias and increase accuracy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they had somebody else that's totally unrelated. That's just bad organization or they probably needed to meet two or three candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was pure administrative <laughs> compliance thing had nothing to do with the reality. So that, yeah, I've That's always had, you know, experiences of bad interviews. I've had bad interviews and uh, the ones which, which were really, I mean, okay. And I, I've got through and I got promotions in my organization. I was doing pretty well. I wanted to just test my skills and go out and see how do I fare in the market and what exactly is the package that I'd be getting. And it's so, I mean, I would say it's funny in a sense uh, where, I, you know, I went ahead and I actually tried a couple of interviews. And I had a, like my resume in there and I had all of my skills. The moment they looked at it, they called me for the interview. And afterwards they, they'd be like, oh, you've done so much. You don't fit for this job role. <laughs> and I've heard that like so many times. The issue is, is that would have been solved by that first question I said in the phone screen. 
Absolutely. I, I, the best thing you've done is far better than what they need done. Then it wasn't a good fit for the job. You wouldn't have been happy. Uh, mm -hmm. On the other hand, if the best thing you've done in the last year mm -hmm. was good fit for the job, you're a perfect candidate. So those are the things that you would have screened out for. You wouldn't have had to waste time uh, or you, they would have said, no, you've really done some nice things and here's why you, we think this job might be good for you. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a much more mutual. Mm -hmm. In my mind, what you need to do is hiring manager has to clearly know what the performance objectives of the job are and mm -hmm. find people who are motivated and competent to do that. And mm -hmm. if you're overqualified for that, and I remember this story from many, many years ago, somebody said he, they didn't like him because he was old. He was <laughs> than me at the time. And he said, well, I'm a PhD in chemistry. Yeah. And I, I'm perfectly competent to do that job. I mm -hmm. said, well, being competent isn't enough. You have to be motivated to do it. When okay. was the last time you did that work? Mm -hmm. And he said, I haven't done it for 10 or 15 years. I said, well, mm -hmm. then you're not competent. Sure. You are overqualified. If you're not interested in doing it, the fact that you can do it is only a half the equation. Motivation mm -hmm. to do it is critical and you and in my mind you had to be motivated to do that in the last six months or a year yeah. and if you haven't it really means you're just doing the job to get paid not to really because you're motivated so i would have agreed with that so Absolutely. that kind of relates a little bit to your situation if you've done this this and that and they don't need all of that yeah you would have been bored with the job so they made the right decision not to move absolutely forward. They, they showed me the mirror and, and it, it was good it was good for me because I wanted to test it out, but then I realized that, that that isn't working out until I had to decide to quit my corporate and start my company. And then that worked amazingly well for me. And then working with different other companies as, as a consultant and then building businesses in my heart truly belonged in, in, in business, building businesses and, and everything to do with that. So that's amazing how it actually played out. Uh, so I'm thankful to them. But I just wanted to understand why would somebody... Uh, you know, knowing and understanding and going through your resume would still take the, uh, you know, take the trouble of actually calling you and actually meeting you face to face. And the, the, the thing that you said right now, uh, eliminating your face to face interaction with digital interaction can save a lot of time, a lot of resources and can also that's a huge solution, I would say. And I, I believe even till today. Until unless we are in a different country, people don't do digital interaction. Is that, well, is that actually, true? Well, more and more they are doing it, mainly because they can't. Everything is remote more and more today. Nowadays, it is remote. Uh, uh -huh. But the other thing that I see is a resume is not a great tool. I figure we should eliminate job description, eliminate resumes. Yes. Just tell people, hey, one of our big projects is this. And if you've done something similar to that, tell us what you've done and we'll figure out if you're in the game. I mean, that, I, would, I would eliminate job descriptions and I would eliminate resumes and we'd be a heck of a lot better off. Mm -hmm. If you can do it, if we think you're good, I'll call you up on the phone, we'll talk about it and then we'll invite you in. So mm -hmm. find the biggest challenge in the job, have mm -hmm. the candidates tell you what they've done that's most related, have a mm -hmm. phone screen and you'd save money and you'd hire better people and you'd save time. So that's my plan. Okay. But future of hiring. <laughs> Absolutely. That's amazing. But I wanted to ask you if, let's say, uh, you know, we don't have a job description, like we don't have a JD, uh, how, how do you go about applying for those jobs if you don't have a JD, like a physical you know, well, description you just, of the job? The job description would be what we need done in this job is build a team of business analysts to create a new software project that does mm -hmm. A, B, and C. Okay. That becomes a job description. If you've done okay. something like that, tell me what you've accomplished mm -hmm. and we'll take a look at it. And if we think it's close, we'll have a phone screen. Mm -hmm. So okay. the job description would be, I call it a performance-based job description. Define okay. the work as a series of performance objectives. Mm -hmm. Ask candidates what they've accomplished related to that. And if there's a fit, you move forward. If there's not a fit, you don't move forward. Right. That's a good idea. That's yeah, it's so simple, right? El Too eliminates simple. a lot of work as well. <laughs> the job description is phony anyway. I don't know if you yeah. need five years experience or three years experience. Some manager uh -huh. said, how many years experience do they need to have to do this job? I think it was yeah. a controller. And I said, I don't know, enough to do the work. And what's the work? Uh -huh. And he told me, you know, upgrade the accounting system. I said, well, they obviously have to have some knowledge to do it. Uh -huh. I don't know if it's five years or 10 years. Truth uh -huh. is, if I could find someone who can do that work in five years, they're a better person than someone who needs 10 years to do that work. Right. So it's nothing to do with the years of experience. It's what people do with what they have that's important. Absolutely. And traditional job descriptions, traditional resumes are phony and useless tools 
that just cause heartache and pain and hiring problems like you've defined? <laughs> so something else, right? So I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, my experience personally, like you said, I, I kind of uh, concur with that. Uh, you know, you said that experience doesn't really matter. I remember, uh, you know, hiring a 19 year old who was studying medicine. So he, he was practicing, not practicing, he was studying MBBS. And his, his interest was into coding. So I said, okay, okay, fine. If you really, I, I got connected with him and he, you know, he said, I really love coding. I said, okay, well, good enough. Uh, you can come join my company. He joined my organization. He started coding for me. He, you know, built websites for my clients and he built websites for me. Uh, he was 19. He worked for like two, two, two and a half, three years with me. And he did amazingly well. You know, all my clients were so happy and I had to let him go because of his studies. Okay. Now what happened, I plan to recruit somebody who's been doing the same work and he claims to do it for 10 years. And when I give him the, gave him the project, the kind of work which I got was absolutely horrendous. <laughs> it was so pathetic. I mean, he just gave me a template. Like I said, even a, a 10 year old can make this. So how do you say you have a 10 year old experience? I, I actually told him, look, I had a 19 year old. He worked for me for two and a half, three years. He was so good at it. He was, he, he was a fresher. And you claim to have 10 years of experience and you, this is what you built for me. So that's so true. But most recruiters don't understand this, Lou. I mean, they don't understand. They just go by experience. So what do you do about that? Well, that's exactly what I said about the phone screen. Yeah. I don't, it's not the years of, that's why I say those things don't matter. It's the quality of the work that matters. True. So you have a 19 year old who's creative, smart, capable, yeah motivated and you get a tw ten, uh, 10 years of experience it's not 10 years of experience they're doing a bunch of junk for 10 years absolutely so i always say it's what people do with what they have that matters so the way i would stop it is tell me about the best thing you've ever done okay and i would I, so if i was going to hire say, tell me about the best thing you've ever done show me the best product you've ever built using your coding mm -hmm. so i would look at the work they did and say okay that's the kind of work we need done so to me you just get a sample of the work and you you figure it out mm -hmm. forget about skills experience Forget about anything that people have. Focus on what people have done and accomplished. Done. That's, That's the difference. That's brilliant. That's brilliant, actually. Well, it's kind and, of common sense, but it's, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but, but people don't use it. Well, they don't <laughs> use know, it is people, right. That's no question about that. Yes, people don't use that. And, and people just go with the traditional way of, you know, tell me about yourself and where will you see yourself in this many years and how, you know, how do you want to, you know, what is that you want to see? Where do you want to see yourself in this company and things like that? But that doesn't really tell you their true personality. That doesn't tell you what they've actually done or what they're capable of doing. And, and this way we can eliminate a lot of, uh, you know, problems of probably retention. Uh, and also, you know, being peop when we can cannot, we, when we can't, uh, you know, retain our employees, that's exactly when we have vacancy and that pressure just to fill up that space or that position that we currently have at the organization makes most of the, of the management to hire teams or, or people or individuals which are just not fit for the job profile. Yep, you're right. Yeah. That's the problem that everybody has and they still have it. And unless they change the way they do things, it will never get better. So, um, yeah. Been, yeah. So to me, there's a simple solution. You define the work you want done. You find people who are motivated to do that. You ask them what they've done and see if it compares. And if it does, you've got a good hire. If it doesn't, don't make, don't move forward. Amazing. Very so, simple. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for that. Now I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. I work with a lot of startups. Uh, the problem with them being budget or finance. So how do you go about, you know, dealing with that situation? How can we solve that problem when they don't have enough funds to hire the best of the people? So we can go by, you know, by attitude or behavior. Like you said, you ask them the question, what's the best that they've done? But what if they haven't done anything and they're freshers, they're just starting in, they're just brand new in the market. How can they, like my example, you know, I hired a, a teenager just with my instincts and I felt that he's amazing. He's brilliant. He said, I love coding. I could see the passion through him and he did an amazing work. I didn't go through a CV like formally, nothing, nothing as such. So how can we, so I, let's say this, that's yeah. not an easy problem to solve depending okay. on, if it's a true startup, mm -hmm. you might just want to go to some universities and find people who are 
capable of doing that kind of work that you can get for reasonably inexpensive amount of money for less money. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully you find someone like your 19 year old, but somebody mm -hmm. who's in university, you might want to talk to some professors at schools who've done it. I know we did that, but it wasn't that we didn't have enough money. We just went to some of the major business schools. And we said, who's mm -hmm. your best students? We want to interview them. But you mm -hmm. could certainly go to that. You could certainly have projects at university. That's the way you would tap into that marketplace. Uh, okay. On the other hand, if you have somebody's invested in your company, mm -hmm. uh, you have to give that person a true career opportunity. It's not about the money. You have to convince someone that this job really represents a true, true career opportunity. Absolutely. And there'll be a payday a year or two after they've started, but they've got to take a sacrifice for the next year or two. So those are the two pieces of advice I'd give. Uh, on the other hand, if they're just a startup and they're playing at it, hope, no money, well, I wouldn't, they, it, that's a low probability event anyway. And I probably would say, so you got to find relatives or people you know, but if you're, if, if people have invested in a company that's got an investment of a million or $2 million, mm -hmm. well, you got to kind of invest in good pe people and you got to find yeah. people who are willing to take the risk and they get a piece of the company if it's successful. So mm -hmm. those are the two strategies that I would use. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Now key takeaways working in like past 40 years in this recruitment industry. Uh, what are the challenges that people mostly face? And, uh, you know, how can we go ahead and deal, deal with that? Apart from the fact that we've already discussed, like we've discussed about retention or bad hiring or things like that. But apart from that, what, what else do you, have you seen in your journey? Okay, so let me kind of, I'm going to use my own career, but yeah. you'll see the point. Yeah. When I started in recruiting, that was not my field of interest. Ah. I was a, I have an engineering degree. I have a master's degree in business. I was running a manufacturing company, oh. but I didn't like the group president. So I quit four times in one year and then said, okay, I'll become a recruiter <laughs> just to find another job. Okay. You know, as a recruiter, I had done work in manufacturing, engineering, high volume production, mm -hmm. supply chain, logistics, cost accounting. Uh, so I knew a lot of the jobs that I was handling. I knew that I actually done them or I had managed a team that had done them. Mm -hmm. And I was a good recruiter because I could interview someone and know if they were good or not. Mm -hmm. But then I took jobs that I wasn't familiar with in medical and other things. And I became a crappy recruiter because I didn't oh, yeah. know the job. Mm -hmm. And I was, I didn't have any confidence in understanding the work, no confidence in reaching out to candidates, no confidence in interviewing candidates and no confidence in closing candidates. Mm -hmm. And I could, my production dropped in half or a third. Mm -hmm. And I realized because I didn't know the work. Okay. So I created a methodology to understand the job, whether I knew it or not. And it was just asking managers, what does success look like on this job? Mm -hmm. So it really was these series of performance objectives. Once you know that, and I'm going to contend, most recruiters short circuit that. They don't know the job. So they just find people who box check, who meet the skills. Absolutely. So a fundamental problem. And they, they can't talk to any good people because a good person knows they're just a box checker. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> so if you don't know the job, the best you can do is hire the best of the bottom half. Let me uh -huh. say that again. If you don't know the job, the best you can do is hire the best of the bottom half. Okay. If you want to hire the best of the top half. You have to know the job. You have to go slower. You have to discuss that person's career needs. You have to be a consultant. You have to understand the hiring manager. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to assess competence. You have to offer a career opportunity where most recruiters can't do that. So right. to me, most recruiters only deal with the best of the bottom half. Mm -hmm. to, if you don't know the job, you just come off as a used car salesman, which in Absolutely. the United States, you're just selling smoke and mirrors. Uh, Absolutely. And to me, it's like any salesperson that you deal with who doesn't know the product uh -huh. is fundamentally going to be uh, a gatekeeper or a transactional salesperson. And to me, that's a fundamental flaw. So if I was going to give any advice all the time, if any recruiters don't know the job, get out of the business because you're just pushing paper. Hiring that managers. That is so important. I mean, I have felt that over and over again. Like they absolutely don't know what they're doing. They're just sitting there at the panel and they're just sitting there just to do their job. And the job is to interview people, but they don't know how to go about the doing that process. So I, I would be like, somebody come tell them. I mean, somebody go tell them like how to do this work. Otherwise they, they're actually not fit to do this because you can't kind of just sit there at a position and, and, and if, if an interviewer, like an inter interviewee walks in or a candidate walks in, you can't just 
you know, ask them random questions and which does not make sense and just tell them, okay, fine, you're done. And, and, and that's just not fair to, to even well, waste, waste anybody's time. That's time. It's, yeah. Well, that absolutely. to me is the big fundamental issue. If you, if you don't know the job, you're going to, success is problematic. If you know the job, you're in the game. And that's the break. That's the breakthrough that people have to make is do not, it's just like any, if you talk to any salesperson who doesn't know the product, you just tune them out. Absolutely. And most, most people who are any, anybody who's any good, who doesn't need a job, ignore mm -hmm. recruiters because they just sell and smoke. <laughs> them. So to me, that's Absolutely. really, if I was going to say one thing, that's what all recruiters should do is understand the job. You learn it in the intake meeting by asking the hiring manager, what does this person need to do to be successful? How are you going to measure their success over the first year? That's how you achieve a win-win hiring outcome. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lou. That's, that's brilliant. Uh, so we are almost at, like, we have to end this in another three minutes, but I want to speak, talk about a little bit uh, the, on the importance of a good team. I have seen that over and over again. The success of my company is definitely because of the people, the kind of people that, that I have had and the kind of teams that we've actually built. So, and recruitment is so important. Hiring is so, so, so important, but most people don't pay attention to this, this, this entire concept of recruitment and hiring. They feel it's just, a, just you know, something that comes naturally to some, but it just does not because your entire business depends on how capable your team members are, how in line they are with your vision and how much they are into your business that they really want to grow along with you. Company is, is well, let me quite, just say this. Yeah. <laughs> let, me kind of, let me end it with my discussion of how you assess team skills. Uh -huh. People judge people's team skill, a candidate's team skills by whether they're friendly and warm or affable or outgoing. Uh -huh. That has nothing to do with good team skills. Uh -huh. Person could be quiet, introverted, funny looking, too old, too young, and have remarkable team skills. Uh -huh. I use I use Sherlock Holmes to assess team skills. I love that man. I love during, I love his work. Yeah. During the interview, I just asked candidates, "Say, hey, tell me what the biggest team you've been on." Okay. How did you get on that team? What role did you play on that team? Who else was on the team? Who did you influence on that team? Mm -hmm. What happened at the end of that team? Did any of those people on that team ask you to be on another team? Mm -hmm. Why did they choose you to be on that other team? If you ask that question of different teams the person's been on, you'll understand that the person has good team skills. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're good because they got great technical skills. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're brought on the team because they can collaborate amongst different yes. people. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're put on teams because they can deal with executives or customers or engineers or accountants. But once you understand and map out the person's team role over two or three years, you'll know if they have good team skills. If those mm -hmm. teams are growing in scope, stature, and complexity with more and more people in them and more influential people, mm -hmm. that person has great team skills, whether you like that person or not. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if the person's always on the same kind of small teams mm -hmm. and yet they're friendly as heck, they don't have mm -hmm. good team skills. Absolutely. So that to me is you don't make a judgment about on your biases of what a good team player is. You have other people who have worked with that person. You look for that judgment to make your assessment. And yeah. I'm happy to have Thank been here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I hope uh, people in India, they would love this bit because they, they always ask me about questions on hiring, recruitments, and teams. So I'm quite sure this has been amazing. And I love the conversation. Thank you so much for your valuable time. Uh, Lou, this was amazing. And uh, yeah, I look forward to having you back again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good evening. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.